Hello, Book Two, and welcome back to Sumerian September 2024, the final day of Sumerian September, Michael K. Vaughn's event all about celebrating Robert E. Howard's Conan. Although the iteration of Sumerian September for 2024 is more about celebrating other people's Conan the Barbarian. This is, we've been mainly dealing with pastiches, good and bad. I don't know about you, but I've been dealing mostly with bad pastiches. Uh, and I had planned to talk about one of those today. I had planned to talk about, let me see if I can show you. Uh, let me go to, it gives you a picture of the cover. Yeah, I had planned to talk about this thing. Conan and the Emerald Lotus by John C. Hawking. I meant to talk about it as uh, a Conan pastiche novel on its own and also as part of a new Conan hardcover release. Uh, and then I realized that the end of the month had snuck up on me, as it always does, but especially it did for some reason in September. Just a couple of days ago, I was saying September only had a few days to go, when it, when it, it was almost over, it, and now it is over today it is over so i could have made that video about a conan and the emerald lotus and i could have mentioned the two times out of 400 pages where conan is in character and other subsidiary subjects of uh how to do conan pastiche I, largely ending up with this look on my face <laughs> and that that struck me the more i thought about it as a bad way to end one of my favorite bookish events of the year. Uh, so instead, I went to the pure well undefiled. I went to a Conan pastiche that is note perfect. There aren't many of those. Uh, so when I find them anywhere, I grab them. And I don't know what significance there is in the fact that almost all the note perfect Conan characterizations I have seen have been in the form of comic books, not novels. Is it possible that the truth buried underneath that is that comic books are the true inhabitors of the pulp tradition, not prose works at all? I don't know. Uh, but I went back to the early 2000s. I went back to uh, the time when Dark Horse Comics got the franchise for, for Conan. Marvel Comics had had it forever and ever. They'd, they'd done Conan the Barbarian for hundreds of issues. They'd done The Savage Sword of Conan for hundreds of issues. Almost all of that, unbelievably, with the same creative team. Uh, certainly the same writer, Roy Thomas. Unbelievable string of quality. Uh, and then Marvel lost the franchise. And it went wandering in the wilderness. And it ended up at Dark Horse, a comic that I had not known all that well. And had no idea what to expect at the time. This was in 2002, 2003. So it was before the alt-left blue checkmark Twitter mind virus took over Marvel and DC Comics and all other comics. It was before all, all superhero, four-color superhero comic books were ideologically compromised. Now, if somebody gets the franchise to Conan, I do know what to expect. I know exactly what to expect. But then, I didn't. The only skittishness in me is that I revered the Marvel run, even though both... Conan the Barbarian in Four Color Comics and The Savage Sword of Conan in Black and White uh, had gone downhill quite a bit in their final years at Marvel. Even though that was true, and even I, even though there was something, I think, called Conan the Adventurer, <laughs> uh, I still had an enormous sentimental soft spot for it. So I was worried that Dark Horse would do a bad job. Basically, I worried that Dark Horse would do a bad job. I shouldn't have worried about that in one respect, because although I wasn't all that familiar with Dark Horse, I wasn't totally unfamiliar with them, and I had never seen them do bad work. Uh, and if you're dealing with a bunch of different writers, a bunch of different editors, a bunch of different artists and inkers and colorists, and yet I've never seen them do bad work, that means that uh, the quality is at the editorial level. And that's pretty surefire. When quality is at the editorial level, that means... The inspirational meetings are taking. That means the decisions, the personnel decisions, are being made correctly to get people on board, to get people fired up. Uh, still, when the time came and Dark Horse launched their Conan the Barbarian comic book, 
they launched it with an issue number zero for just 25 cents instead of the two dollars i think that comics were at the time uh it was meant to be just a prologue an introduction to conan to how they were going to do conan uh it was written by kurt Busiek, which again should have been a real positive sign in my mind because kurt Busiek is a fantastic writer uh, and it was drawn by Carrie Nord. And the, the little glimpses that I saw of the artwork in industry magazines made it look odd. Conan didn't, he didn't look hyper chiseled the way he had an, in John Buscema's drawing. I didn't quite know what to make of it. He, he didn't look hyper chiseled. And in a couple of preliminary drawings, it looked like he was wearing a dress. Uh, so I waited <laughs> i just waited and then issue number zero came to my lcs my local comic shop and i got it uh and i was blown away just plain blown away by how good it was it is the best introduction to any comic book series that i have ever seen <laughs> before ever and since it's this it's conan the bar conan number zero the legend uh, and there you can see what I mean. Conan is wearing, I guess not a dress, a kilt. Conan seems to be wearing some sort of kilt, which is a little on the odd side to me. It, I was so used to the bearskin loincloth of John Buscema's Conan that I got rigid in my expectations in ways that are bad. I mean, Conan has been drawn in all kinds of ways. It's not all that important. Uh, so I started reading. And... Uh, Right away, I was amazed. We have a caravan wandering through the wilderness with a bored prince on board. A bored prince is being taken on uh, by litter to look at the far distant kingdoms that have been conquered by his father, the ruler, and he's been sent out to assess. Uh, and he's saying, what a miserable land, league upon league of forest and mud, of ruins and a few hovels clustered together and called a village, the rain, the flies, the clammy air, the dull vacant stares in the eyes of those who root in the mud here. For, for two copper coins, I burn it all, bare earth, burn it all, piss on it, on the ashes and be done with it. But he is reminded that he has to take uh, an assessment of this land. He's reminded by his vizier, his tall, thin advisor. And he is not under any illusion. He says, oh, please, I'm not the fool my father thinks. He dallies with his latest pallid whore and sends me hence while he decides to have my brothers and I killed. We send back plundered gold and chained slaves, and that is all that matters. I want to point out here, a mistake it's a common mistake even great writers can do it and it's easy to fix if you ever find yourself in a position where you're wondering because there is a grammatical error there while he decides to have my brothers and i killed is wrong i is nominative so if you're wondering you know i've got i've got two people so and so and me so and so and i do i use i or me take the other person out that's the surest way it will never let you wrong take the other person out and if the sentence sounds like nonsense, that's because it is. And you should have been using the other form of the word. So this sentence, uh, while he decides to have my brothers and, and I killed, what if you change that to, while well, he decides to have I killed? Well, of course, you wouldn't say that. You know right away the right thing. It's me. Well, he decides to have my brothers and me killed. <laughs> that's the easiest way to do that. But uh, the prince is bored and it doesn't, foresee any entertainment in the future when one of his outlying one of his his outrunners comes to him and tells him that they have found something worth note in a cave he is distrustful but he's bored so he goes to the cave and the first thing he sees is the thing you think is going to amaze him which is the floor is covered in gold it's a massive trove of treasure but that's not what arrests his attention this does he and his wazir encounter a tipped over, molding, chipped, obviously very old statue. And we, the reader, know immediately who that is. <laughs> we don't need them to brush off the inscription and find out. We know who that is. But it's jarring all the same because obviously a long, long time has passed. From any Conan story, what an odd way to start a run on Conan. 
Uh, the, the prince wants to know who this is. Look at this beautiful artwork by Carrie Nord. Just beautiful artwork. And he, your eyes are not deceiving you. Wazir has slit like cat eyes. <laughs> Might become important. Uh, the Wazir is trying to uh, tell this prince that this is probably nothing. This is just a hill bandit. I think if you're if you've got a little bit of hindsight, you can tell that one of these men is curious about this statue. And it's just possible that the other of these men recognizes the person who is carved in the statue. But either way, the prince is intrigued. The Wazir says, perhaps some local chieftain or minor king, exalted one, a bloody-handed brute, long dead, nothing to concern, and the, the prince interrupts him. No. No, this one is different somehow. The other carvings and portraits we have found show petrified god-kings, silk-draped martinets in love with their own gaze. This man, he looks rough, dangerous, real. Something about his expression, the eyes. Again, we know who this is, and we know that the prince is entirely right. His instincts are entirely right. He instructs his wazir to assemble a record, find out everything that was, to, that was ever written by these people, these Nemedians, who are in this neighborhood, find out every record they've ever kept on this guy, put it into a coherent narrative, and re report back to me when your research is done. And we get the classic visual image of time passing in that leaves are blowing in the wind, so that we know that time has passed. And the wazir has assembled a record. Uh, by sorting through the, the historical chronicles from the tedious accounts of grain bought and sold, and so on, uh, the prince insists on hearing it. And I was wondering, what on, or what on earth is this? When I was reading this the first time, I was sitting there and I was thinking, what on earth is this? Are, are you going to have Conan come back uh, in this far distant era? Are these stories not going to take place in the Hyborian age proper? Why are you, what is all this setup? And then the wazir unrolls a scroll, the scroll that he has compiled of these, the stories of this Conan person. And he says, no. Oh, Prince. Now, <laughs> I sat up and whooped when I read that. I startled my girls when I read that. I sat up and whooped. And you're going to hate, you're going to need to know a little bit about Robert E. Howard's Conan to know why I whooped. That is how the Conan stories start. No, oh, Prince. That once upon a time, oh, I'll read it to you. I'll read the whole thing to the whole invocation. I never tire of reading it. But, in all the time that we are reading Robert E. Howard's Conan stories, we don't know who that prince is. We know that these stories are being told of a far distant era, a distant era in time. That they are being told to a prince, we have no idea who it is. Here it is. No, O oh prince, this is where is where that is. And then we get the famous invocation. I will not hear revive the O Wars of, la of last year and the year before. Uh, I will not revive the wars of Kroibling over whether or not this is supposed to be O or O-H. We'll leave that to history to decide. Instead, I will read you the immortal inscription of the Conan stories. Know, O Prince, that between the years when the oceans drank Atlantis and the gleaming cities and the years and the rise of the sons of Arius, there was an age undreamed of, when shining kingdoms lay spread across the world like blue mantles beneath the stars. Nemedia, Ophir, Brithunia, Hyperborea, Zamora, with its dark-haired women and towers of spider-haunted mystery. Zingara, with its chivalry. Koth, that bordered on the pastoral lands of Shem. Stygia, with its shadow-guarded tombs. Hycrania, whose riders wore steel and silk and gold. But the proudest kingdom of the world was Aquilonia, reigning supreme in the dreaming west. Just incredible. Y your visual instinct tells you, all right, I'm going to make this cavalry really impressive, but no, no. You put the cavalry in shadow, you give a blood-red banner, and you make the city impressive. The city is solid gold gleaming in the sun. What a beautiful choice. That is just beautiful. Uh, hither came Conan, the Sumerian, and look, we get him riding out of darkness. Before we see him, we see his silhouette. 
Here, hither came Conan the Sumerian, black-haired, sullen-eyed, sword in hand. <laughs> a thief, a reaver, a slayer, with gigantic melancholies and gigantic mirth. Look at that. Again, any Conan fan from Marvel Comics is going to look at that and immediately know, this is all just so perfect. This is all just so perfect. Uh, with gigantic melancholies and gigantic mirth to tread the jeweled thrones of earth under his sandaled feet. The wazir is taken with this. Uh, or rather, the prince is. The wazir is very reluctantly telling these stories. It is, it is visually signaled that just perhaps this wazir is Thothamun, Conan's great enemy. But that ends the story. We, the only part of the, the record that the wazir has assembled is the great invocation that we get at the beginning of Conan's stories. Then we get Carrie Nord's sketchbook of what all these different people are going to look like. Just little things here and there. And that is Conan number zero for Dark Horse. That's an introduction to the job they intend to do. <laughs> Technically not a Conan pastiche, because we don't get any Conan. But wonderful, all the same. Just a perfect, perfect invocation of the character. Not... and. I consider it close enough to pastiche. This is the zero issue of a comic. And also, we do get a characterization of Conan. He's not around to hear it. But we do get a characterization of him that works just fine. That he isn't one of those mirror-staring popinjays. That he's rough. Dangerous. Real. Uh, which is, I would argue, the hallmark of Robert E. Howard's Conan as opposed to a lot of the pastiche Conans. Robert E. Howard's Conan is real. Feels it. Definitely real. So I thought I would end on a high note. I thought I would end Sumerian September on a high note and just go over this issue again, Conan number zero from Dark Horse. I've, I've gone over this issue before, but I love it so much. I love it so much that I figure that's how we'll end Sumerian September 2024. Uh, of course, I want to thank Michael K. Vaughn for creating this event. Only he could have done it. And I want to thank all of you who not only have participated, but have also uh, written to me all sorts of, of conversations about various points that I've raised in the course of the month. All sorts of fascinating conversations, not most of them agreeing with me. Just wonderful. Just wonderful, wonderful stuff to go over all of this stuff in so much, in so much genuine detail, but also so much fun. <laughs> it's just, as usual for Sumerian September, it was just a huge amount of fun. Uh... Michael K. Vaughn made a, a video saying goodbye to Sumerian September 2024 himself. In that video, he mentions that uh, next year, the plan for Sumerian September will be to concentrate on the precursors to Conan. Uh, Bran McMorn, King Cull, and Solomon Kane. <laughs> and we'll just have to hope that Michael K. Vaughn was a little tipsy when he made that video, and he didn't mean it. <laughs> Otherwise, oh, it's going to be a long month for Steve. <laughs> but in the meantime, I'm going to sign off on Sumerian September for this year. What a joy it was. I will uh, I will wrap this up for now. I'll see you all next time. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.